Well, hello, everyone. How's everyone doing? Wild Goose is always wild, and I'm really grateful to be here, but also really hot and hungry. So if I start becoming incoherent at any point, just forgive me. Uh, no. Today, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about a new book that's coming out that I've had the pleasure of putting together over the past year. Um, my name is Brandon Robertson, and I have the honor of serving as the lead pastor of Mission Gathering Christian Church in San Diego, California. But before that, for the past five or six years, I've been engaged in the work of trying to move the conservative evangelical church towards LGBT inclusion. And over the past six years, um, that work has led me into other groups like the Mormon Church, um, the Anglican Communion, and different groups like that, talking about this topic of what it means to embrace LGBT inclusion, yes. But now my focus is more, what, is, what happens once a church embraces LGBT people? Is that the final step? Have you become the ideal progressive community once you've put a rainbow flag on the front door or done a gay marriage? I was actually asked to write this book. Uh, Deb approached me two years ago, maybe a year ago, um, in Denver, and over coffee one morning, she said, we have this idea that there are so many churches, um, especially in our denomination, the denomination I belong to now, the Disciples of Christ, that are fully affirming and accepting, and they have rainbow flags, and they march in the pride parade, but it ends there. Nothing seems to go beyond that big step and people seem to be very content with inclusion that ends with LGBT inclusion. And that launched me on a journey of thinking, as somebody who's been an LGBT activist, who's somebody who's been engaged in this work, how has my own work perpetuated this problem of inclusion only means LGBT people, mostly LGB people, and end this there? So today I'm gonna basically, uh, this talk is adapted from different chapters in the book. I'm gonna give you just a brief preview of the conclusions that I've come to, but then I wanna spend a good chunk of our time today just talking because I think it's more interesting um, what you all have to say than what I have to say. So hopefully we'll engage in some good conversation. And again, as that time comes, if you move forward so that they can pick up your um, voice on the audio, um, that would be great. So I'll begin by the way I begin the book, which is with this question. Have you ever walked into a church that says all are welcome in bold letters on the sign out front, but the moment you walk in the door, you realize that all doesn't really mean all? Or have you ever walked into a church flying a rainbow flag out front, but when you go in and look around, you realize that the flag actually means that the church is inclusive of gay white men primarily? Or have you ever walked into a church that touts itself as progressive and therefore inclusive, but if you stick around long enough, you find out that if you don't belong to the right demographics, the right political parties, the right social categories, then you're probably gonna have a really hard time fitting in and being a part of that community. You see, this concept of inclusion is a tricky concept, especially when we're talking about inclusion in religious contexts. Inclusion has become one of the most important words in most religious spaces, whether they're conservative or progressive. Everybody wants to be seen at some regard as inclusive because naturally, if we look at the life of Jesus, if you identify as Christian, there's no denying that there's a degree of inclusion, but what the debate centers around is who would Jesus include and how far, far would his inclusion go? Yet in my experience, in our increasingly pluralistic and globalized world that values inclusion, most churches and leaders that tout the word inclusion don't actually understand the radical implications of what it means to be inclusive. For most of our communities, to be inclusive means that you're inclusive of one minority community. You're either a church committed to racial justice, which probably means that you're trying just to get more people of color to show up on Sunday morning, or you could be a gender inclusive church that puts a couple women up front to speak or preach a couple times a year, or you could be an LGBT inclusive church that is really big on trying to get gay people on your worship team so that they feel more accepted and welcomed. All of those things are holy and beautiful and important. They're all essential steps on the process to inclusion, but they're not, if you're stopping at any one of those categories, you're not understanding the radical implication and ramifications of inclusion. Because if your church 
stops at racial justice to the detriment of gender justice and uh, justice for differently abled people and all the various categories of those who are marginalized, then it's not truly inclusive. It means we fail to understand the very basic premise of inclusion. When I was first asked to write this book, True Inclusion, I wrestled with what are the true implications and ramifications. As I sat down to write the book, especially in our socially, politically tense cultural climate that emerged around 2017 when I started writing, my convictions around inclusion began to change. I began to be gravely concerned about churches and individuals and organizations that moved on LGBT inclusion, but failed to see that the same social and spiritual and theological principles that helped them move on that didn't apply to other areas of justice that were arising in our cultural consciousness. Far too many communities and individuals were too content to pat themselves on the back for having an LGBT person in their church, but not really willing to engage in the deep work of systemic change in the church, in their community, and in the broader society to become truly inclusive. Even today, so many of our progressive, so-called progressive Christian organizations that carry the banner of justice fail to take inclusion to its logical conclusion. Usually, these organizations and churches, they fear that they're going to isolate the more conservative base, and therefore they stop short of true inclusion. What I've become convicted of as I've watched our culture um, and as I've encountered the prophetic ministry of Jesus in scripture was that there was no room in the gospel for half-hearted inclusion. There was no incremental path or safe trajectory towards embracing people in the way that God embraces people, in the way that Jesus embraces people. You're either all in for inclusion or your inclusion was probably, I discovered, a selfish marketing scheme in order to look more relevant, to look more progressive, to look more inclusive without actually having to do the work and pay the price that comes for being inclusive. And these are harsh words, I know. But through the process of writing this book and then in the same period of time becoming a pastor of an inclusive church, I discover that sometimes it's only through speaking the prickly, uncomfortable, undiluted truth about inclusion that would provoke people to actually begin to think deeply and perhaps even follow Jesus. What a radical idea on this idea, uh, on this path towards radical embrace. So what do I mean when I talk about true inclusion and communities of radical embrace? What does it mean to engage in the radically inclusive path of Jesus? I begin by zooming out of our theological or religious arguments and looking at and look at inclusion from a psychological and social perspective. A psychotherapist that I know that we all probably know in this room, uh, Brene Brown writes, a deep sense of love and belonging is an irreducible need of all people. We are biologically, cognitively, physically, and spiritually wired to love, to be loved, and to belong. What those, when those needs are not met, we don't function as we're meant to. We break, we fall apart, we numb, we ache, we hurt others, we get sick. This same sentiment has been echoed by psychotherapists and philosophers and theologians throughout the ages. Even from the earliest pages of our own text, the Hebrew Bible, we're told that God looks at the singular human, the Adam, and says, it's not good for this person to be alone. There's a need for community. There's a need for belonging and inclusion. It then follows that when we're forced to the margins, when we're forced out of relationship, we're creating a deep human trauma. We're doing great harm. We're chopping away at the fundamental humanity of whoever it is that we are excluding. And the psychological data supports this. Consistently, all of the data shows across the board that those who are ejected from their families or schools or religious communities because of any aspect of their identity that has been marginalized have higher suicide rates, have higher depression rates, have higher mental illness rates. We see that the fruit of exclusion is bad fruit. And Jesus says, if a tree produces bad fruit, it should be cut down and thrown into the fire. And I think that's a harsh word, but again, an important word for us. If a community that claims to follow the God who promises abundant life to all, especially those on the margins, but produces death and destruction, that community cannot be said to be a community modeled on Jesus Christ. Exclusion 
objectively harms. But not, does, not only does exclusion create this tangible psychological and physical harm to those who are excluded, exclusion harms the communities themselves that are doing the exclusion. True inclusion demands that we recognize that only when we're together in our great diversity do we truly reflect the full divinity of God. That only when we're together in our variety of perspectives and backgrounds and identities and experiences do we truly become what the Apostle Paul called the body of Christ, united around every identity, every aspect. And those identities will push us to become better and think differently and grow and evolve. And that's what spiritual life, that's what spiritual community is all about. Whenever we're compelled to declare that someone doesn't belong, whether it's because of sexuality or ethnicity or backgrounds or beliefs or different abledness or neediness or inconvenience or struggles, we're entering into a process of dehumanization both of ourselves and of the person that we're marginalizing. And that is an assault on the fundamental image of God in every person. By attempting to cut off a unique incarnation and manifestation of the beauty of God, simply because we do not agree or feel comfortable with them, is an act of great trauma. It's an act of great harm. It is, I would suggest, one of the greatest sins and if we do try to justify such exclusion, we need to be held accountable. And our churches and our organizations need to be held accountable for the tangible, verifiable harm that they're doing. Most exclusive communities get off the hook. They don't get called out for the actual destruction that they leave in their path. But communities of exclusion physically, tangibly harm real people. And that needs to be named, that needs to be said, that needs to be called out and people must be held accountable for that. I think that's not only a gospel imperative, that's just a common good human imperative. So for those of us who might find ourselves being inclusive, we need to speak up and declare that those who exclude are engaging in something that's causing literal harm to actual people and show them the impact of that. Because it's not just a matter of differing ideologies or beliefs. This is a matter of spiritual, social, and psychological abuse. And that needs to be named. Then when we shift from looking at the psychological idea of inclusion and exclusion, and we begin to look exclusively at our own tradition, the gospel of Christ, we're even more compelled to seek a deep sense of inclusion in our lives and in our world. It only takes one reading through the gospel text to see that Jesus, in all of his life and teaching, the principle that emerges is inclusion is the burning heart of his gospel. The message and ministry of Jesus centers around a radical, robust, and inconvenient message that all people, regardless of their religious convictions or their political affiliations or their ethnic identities or their gender identities, they were worthy of God's love and they were worthy of equal justice in their society. We see Jesus engaging in this kind of work and this kind of preaching time and time and time again. Jesus constantly launches an unambiguous assault on the systems that seek to oppress and marginalize those in his society, even the systems that he belonged to and that privileged him. He declared a theological and a political message that in God's ordering of things, all people were to be given an equal seat at the table. In God's ordering of the world, the mountains are made low and the valleys are exalted. The mighty are humbled and the humiliated are endowed with power. And if this message of the gospel is true, then our world and our lives and our churches must necessarily be fundamentally changed. A death must occur, a death to our egoic self, our fleshly desires who prefer to uplift, uplift the voices and people that look like us and act like us and make us feel comfortable. A sacrifice must occur of our own power and privilege and comfort. We must lay our lives on the altar of sacrifice, not to appease an angry God, but to demonstrate to our neighbors that we're serious about this message of radical embrace, that they are fully loved, and that we will li not live for our own self-interest, but for the collective good of all of us together. And to make that sacrifice, it requires faith, faith that the Spirit of God is actually moving humanity towards some higher way of being.
that when we sacrifice our own privilege, we won't be betrayed by those around us and find ourselves on the bottom of an oppressive pyramid. And to be honest, there's no guarantee that kind of thing won't happen. That's why the faith, that's why the sacrifice is involved. But it's still a call for all of us if we claim to follow Jesus. History shows us that more often than not, those who awaken to the gospel and the way that the gospel calls us to see and be in the world, we often end up being marginalized or oppressed, taken advantage of because we're seen as threatening to the systems of power. And those systems are just happy to add another person to their pyramid of oppression. And this is why I believe Jesus said that the path to life is narrow and few be that find it. The path to follow Christ, the path to create a more just and equal world, it costs a lot. But if we desire to see the more beautiful world that our hearts know is possible, then the sacrifice is worth it. If we believe that Jesus' vision for a world where the mountains are lowered and the valleys are exalted, where the first are the last and the last are first, we m then we must be willing to embrace this path of radical, true inclusion. Now, I've just kind of summarized the theological ideology behind the book. But I want to practically talk just for a couple minutes about what it actually looks like when true inclusion is implemented in our communities. And the first one is one that I think most people in this space will resonate with, but I discovered this past week. Um, this word is actually really taboo in our conservative brothers and sisters circles. Uh, if we are to be truly inclusive, the first step is that our inclusion must be intersectional. Black feminist scholar Kimberly Williams Crenshaw first coined the term intersectionality in the 1980s to describe her observation of the race and gender justice and how those movements were not being linked together in the public sphere, and yet how they were linked together in the lived and incarnated lives of the people that were fighting for gender justice and for racial justice. One of the examples that Crenshaw draws on in her inter, uh, introduction to intersectionality is the idea of Anita Hill, who was an African-American attorney who in 1991 accused her former boss, Clarice Thomas, of sexual harassment. As Hill made her case, two opposing groups arose in the culture and in the news cycle to support her. One group, the women's rights movement, took her and took her story and said this is a battle for the rights of women. And another group was the civil rights movement that began to see this as an issue of race, an issue of injustice based on the color of her skin and her ethnicity. According to Crenshaw's analysis, Anita Hill's experience of sexual assault was both a result of racism and sexism. And you couldn't separate one or the other. But in the public consciousness, she was forced to choose to address the issue as only an issue primarily of gender justice. And that's the narrative that really formed around her story at the time. See, the oppressive system of patriarchy, which I argue in the book is the singular system of oppression behind all oppression in our society, stands upon the intersections of race, gender, class, and sexual orientation. And because of that, because patriarchy is interested in marginalizing people of all of those different categories, all of them and their pursuit of justice are inextricably linked. To understand the oppression of any one group, one has to look at the forces of oppression that affect all identities, connect it to any one of these issues. To address one facet of the identity only does not produce liberation. It does not address the root cause, the systemic oppression that is perpetuating injustice and exclusion. Thus, while Anita Hill became a figure for the women's rights movement, the general public ignored her experience as an African-American woman, an experience that differs tremendously from those of white women who also experience sexual assault. Similarly, this is why the most severely oppressed people in our society, which are trans women of color, who embody every layer of patriarchal oppression, we can't understand how to seek oppression for trans women of color unless we understand intersectional justice. Because you can't just liberate the gender component. You can't just liberate the ethnicity component or the sexuality component. It's all linked for so many people. And if we're going to be inclusive, you can't just be an LGBT inclusive church when a trans woman of color joins your congregation. Because 
the systems of oppression at work are all linked together and are forcing and creating this force of exclusion. To become truly inclusive is to work to understand that intersectional identities of every individual and understanding those identities from that point being called to create communities and societies where we understand our, and, and are engaged in the work of liberating every aspect of oppressed identity. The goal of being inclusive should never be and cannot be to become a more interesting or bigger community. But instead, it's the salvation and liberation of every single aspect of any person's identity so that they can be the full incarnation of God that they are called to be in the world. To seek and to be the salvation and redemption for our world through the liberation of each individual. And to do so, we have to begin with an understanding of how all of the structures in our society and in our churches and in our movements are set up to perpetuate oppression in all of its various forms. I can't tell you how many times I've sat down with pastors of churches who have a conversation with me that sounds something like this. Uh, they just dealt with some controversial topic from the pulpit. Say it's women in ministry. And I eventually ask them, so when are you going to deal with racism? Only to be told something along the lines of, well, race really isn't our passion right now. It's not what we're feeling called to deal with. We can only focus on one problem at a time. Both of these responses are fundamentally, they fundamentally show a misunderstanding of the very problem that they are trying to address. And therefore, they will inevitably falter and harm the very people they're trying to include. If your church is willing to focus on gender justice, giving women and men equal roles in your church, then you must also begin to address racism, classism, LGBT inclusion. They're all connected. The theology that one uses usually to shift in any one of these areas is the same theology that's often going to be used to shift in other areas. Because the issue again isn't just about racism or sexism or homophobia. Each of those are a pillar of a larger system of oppression called patriarchy. And Jesus came to liberate us from the full weight of the patriarchal system. And in order to do that, we must dismantle all of its pillars at the same time. In order to practice intersectional inclusivity, we must humble ourselves and listen to the voices of the marginalized both within and outside of the walls of our community. And be willing to publicly, boldly, loudly repent of the harm that we've done. And be willing to listen to them and change our traditions and our practices and our beliefs to reflect the heart of our inclusive creator, no matter what the personal cost is to us and our community. And the second principle that I wanna highlight, which this one's not groundbreaking, but it's one that we often forget, is that if we're going to become truly inclusive people or communities, we must embrace the principle of empathic understanding. A few years ago, while I was consulting a group of evangelical pastors about how they could move their church towards full inclusion of LGBT people, I came to the realization that all of the theological and ideological and social and political arguments I could throw at them didn't work. They weren't changing people's perspectives. Their community wasn't shifting because the pastor had a shift in theology. What they needed was to hear and understand that among them, there were already the voices of LGBT people that were not being heard. They were voices that were there, they were part of the community, but they were being marginalized, silenced, and oppressed. And unless the individuals in a community began to understand the incarnate reality of the LGBT people they were seeking to include, they could never shift their heart or mind towards actual inclusion and embrace. What's different about what I've come to understand as empathic understanding in this context is that this isn't a one-time action. It's not enough to call a bunch of people to, of color to a table at your church for one night to talk about the problems of racial injustice in your congregation. That's not true empathic understanding. That's not modeling the incarnational and empathic way of Jesus. The incarnation is something that the Christian church, Christian theology gives us that is the most profound way to understand empathic understanding. In the person of Jesus, the Christian church says God stepped into the world and experienced what it was like to be a human. God didn't just listen to the plight of humans. 
God experienced what it was like to be a human, to walk alongside our humanity and to discover what the world was like through our eyes. Similarly, when I'm talking about empathic understanding, I'm talking about doing the hard work of moving outside of the walls of our churches and into spaces where there are people that are different, where there are people that might make us uncomfortable, where there are people who see things or identify differently. Empathic understanding is not something that naturally happens. It's something that must be pursued. It's something that must be intentionally engaged in. And it takes a lot of work and a lot of energy. But again, if we dare call ourselves followers of Jesus, this is a fundamental aspect of what radical, true discipleship looked like. Jesus understood that true and lasting change comes only in proximity to those who are marginalized and excluded. And Jesus showed us, showed us that change must happen within ourselves rather than with those who are excluded. If you're to walk into any denominational office in North America, you're more than likely going to stumble on conversations of denominational officials, especially mainline officials, wondering why their churches are declining and how they can attract more people to show up. Very few institutions are willing to have the conversation about how to do life in the community rather than build a bigger institution and community for themselves. Very few institutions are thinking about ways that they can open up their properties to become hubs in which the community that they're trying to reach can use rather than focus on how their church can maximize it for their own good. Yet Jesus never stayed in a place of power. Instead, he helped people enter into abundant life by meeting them where they were located. Whereas at the heart of most institutionalized religion, the desire is to create conformity, to make people join an institution, Jesus never demanded such conformity, but met people as they were, and I think you can make a case, was changed himself through the encounters with his others. What if our faith communities were to become touch points, places where people could come together and learn, to provoke one another, to organize, but then intentionally pushed people out of the institution and went out into the world to meet the needs and desires of communities and cultures beyond the faith community itself? What if local faith communities existed to uplift and empower local leaders who are actually doing the work of justice, to give them the resources and the places to host events from their own culture and perspective and worldviews? And what if it looked like those who were connected to faith communities showed up to support and learn and to participate rather than to be the leaders? What if we platformed the very people that we're seeking to bring into our community, the people we're seeking to engage? I think what would emerge is this deep sense, this radical posture of empathic understanding. We would invite and be changed by those who are not typically members of a typical faith community. And I think we begin to impact the world in the way that Jesus called us to impact the world. We begin to see our culture and communities and the systems of injustice and oppression overturned and changed. It would give the world an opportunity to see from another's perspective. And it would model this vision of Jesus, his vision for the kingdom of God, the place where everyone was welcome to join into this boisterous dinner party. And occasionally even going to the institution itself and stirring things up. On a practical note, one of the last things I want to hammer home, and one thing that I really focus on in the book is this, that to become truly inclusive, to become truly intersectional, to become truly empathic, this is not a strategy to grow your church. Let me say that again. If you're going to embrace the radical implications of the social and political views and teachings of Jesus, this is not going to give you the next Willow Creek Community Church, and that shouldn't be the goal. If you're going to embrace this path, this radical path, it's likely going to decrease some of the numbers of the folks who like to show up in your community. It's certainly going to decrease those who are most comfortable the wealthy, the privileged, the white folks who come and often give in the offering and are the pillars of the church, those people don't want to be in contact and in proximity as much as they might ideologically to the incarnated reality of true inclusion. At Mission Gathering, the church I've been pastoring for the past year, this is a complicated matter. The more we lean into true inclusion, 
the more I push away those who are comfortable with traditional Christianity and those who really want to embrace the traditional theological status quo and are just looking for that country club Christianity that's become so popular and so foundational to American Christianity. Folks become uncomfortable when they're in proximity to the marginalized people that ideologically they support. But also, the people who begin to come to your church when you're leaning into radical inclusion, the people that your church actually begins to empower, the, the forces that begin to rise up to live out the way of Jesus are often the very people that Jesus said should make up the church, those from the margins, those who have been pushed out. But even those people, I've discovered, are not likely to stick around in an institutionalized church for a long time. In the book, I talk about this principle called the revolving door. I see mission gathering, I've had to see, even though my elders were terrified when I told them this, that our church was leaning into this idea of being a revol revolving door. We're a place where some people who are about to give up faith altogether come in, rediscover a new way of being Christian that's progressive and inclusive, and probably will leave and go find some other version of spirituality or something better to do on Sunday mornings. And are we okay with that? Is our goal to build an institution, or are we here to empower, to heal, and to actually make change in people's lives and in our society? This is a hard question for institutions that are trying to survive. It's a hard question for the denominations that are represented here at Wild Goose. But I think it's a time, we're in a period of history where the level of consciousness in our nation is rising, and we have to come and take an account, count the cost. Are we willing to follow in the radically inclusive path of Jesus, or are we more interested in maintaining this Christianity that has evolved over the past 2,000 years? I think that truly inclusive communities measure their success not by Sunday service attendance or by those who have entered into their discipleship programs. It's measured by people engaged throughout the week through various manifestations of the community doing justice and living into the radical way of Jesus in the world. That's what church growth, church health, that's what the church should be measuring its success by. And I want to conclude my talk and then enter into some conversation with you in the same way that I conclude the book. And that's by offering just a simple challenge that I think most of you are probably already on the same page with. In the beginning of the Hebrew Bible, we're told a story about how the Spirit of God created all humanity out of this single person. And throughout the rest of the biblical narrative, we see the, multipli we saw, see the multiplicity that emerges from that one. We see complexity and diversity and beauty emerge out of one. And we begin to see that the world, that God, becomes more complex. By the time we arrive the, at the apocalyptic vision in the book of Revelation, we see what's supposed to be the pinnacle of the Christian story, which is this gathering of people from all nations, tribes, backgrounds, tongues, I want to say sexualities and gender identities and social classes and different abilities, gathered around the throne of Christ, gathered around the banquet table, equal as one. We see at the beginning of the Hebrew Bible, darkness, but by the end of the book of Revelation, we see this image where there's no need for a sun anymore because light is the dominant force in this new reality that's been created. In this image of gradual awakening and redemption and progress, like a seed slowly planted over time that comes into full bloom, we see humanity's evolution. We see this stretching towards a new way, a better way of seeing and being in the world. In this picture, we see God's redemptive purposes come to their completion and the universe as it was intended to be, where all are united in the midst of our diversity, where in all of our complexity, not our conformity, we stand around the throne of God as one. As followers of Jesus, this is the reality for which we should long for and strive. A world united in diversity, a world where all are celebrated and included, and a world where discrimination and exclusion no longer have a place. And yet, as I speak these words, I'm very aware, and so are you, that Donald Trump is the president of the United States. And that throughout this presidency, we've seen the unveiling of that which was always there, which is bigotry and xenophobia in many forms that have been hiding beneath the surface, or at least beneath the surface of those of us who are privileged and haven't been able to see them as clearly. It's easy to look at the state of the world in 2018 and wonder whether this inclusive gospel is really impactful at all, whether this is actually a possible reality to create. But I want to end by giving you um, an idea that a theologian named L. Robert Keck proposed, 
called the supernova effect. The supernova refers to the experience of a star burning brightest right before it dies. And I think that we are on the edge, I hope we are on the edge, I pray we are on the edge of a moment, at least in this small chunk of our nation's history, where these forces of patriarchy, these forces of white supremacy, these forces of oppression are having their last moments of shining. They're coming back in all of their full-fledged strength, but are going to be defeated by this arising consciousness. I think the fact that the Wild Goose Festival is growing every year with more people stepping up and saying, I identify as a follower of Jesus, but the way we've been doing this Christian thing isn't working. It's actually harming the world, not helping the world. I think we have reason to be hopeful. I think in these moments, we have a reason to stand strong, to be united, to be re-energized, to look for those voices that are beginning to speak up, that are finding platform, and to give platform to new voices that can actually speak the radical words of justice, the radical words of repentance that need to be spoken to our communities. Almost every Sunday as a pastor, I have the privilege of providing over communion at our church. And every Sunday, I have such a profound sense of joy, honestly, when I see the people in our church of every race, gender identity, sexual orientation, political affiliation, socioeconomic status, gathered into our strange ragtag community and coming forward to this unique table where we say, God has invited us all. And when I extend those words of radical invitation to the table, I feel their power. They're powerful because I've sat in so many church contexts that have built a strong and a high wall around the communion table, reserving it for those who believe the right things, who look the right way, who voted the right way, but there's something transcendent about participating in the very ritual that millions have used to marginalize and amplify an exclusive gospel and repurposing that and I think returning it to its original root. There's something truly humbling when we see those with the least amount of privilege, those who have been considered unclean by the religious establishment, that they're the ones who come up to the table and serve the bread and the wine. In this sense, communion becomes this powerful act of resistance and of hope. It embodies that eternal declaration to the powers that be that their orthodoxies and institutions and boundaries, they are mere exclu uh, illusions. And it's a sure sign that the kingdom of God is beginning to emerge and that they can't control it. And the last are becoming first. That which was once considered unclean is now declared holy. There's something profound that happens at the communion table. For we not only all stand together around the throne of the Lamb as one, but the culmination of John's vision and of communion is that everyone is called to this banquet table, the heavenly marriage supper, which is the ultimate metaphor of our union with God and our union with each other. For in Christ, the many become one. One new humanity emerges through the power of self-sacrificial love and through the example of Christ, we see the walls of division based on identity being destroyed. Out of one body with many parts, we see this union and this beauty and this diversity of humanity. But in such days of divisiveness in our world, we're limited. And I messed that up. But the days of such divisiveness in our world are limited as more and more of us awaken to this inclusion imperative and begin to do the inner work of tearing down our own walls of prejudice, our own walls of racism and xenophobia, and begin to fearlessly work in our communities to transform them to be truly inclusive. The last thing I'll say is that the journey to inclusion does not happen overnight. And it will inevitably throw our communities and throw us into periods of pain and tribulation and struggle. But as James so poignantly writes, the testing of our faith produces endurance. And when endurance is full and complete, we will be made full and complete, lacking in nothing. So I want to invite us all to lean into the challenge, to embrace the process, to pour out our lives, to sacrifice our churches and our privilege to build a more inclusive world. Because this is the work that we're called to do. This is the goal of our faith and this is the hope of the world that all are welcome to the table as equal and vital participants, bearing the full glory of God in the midst of our expansive diversity. Amen? Okay, I think we have like 10 minutes left, so let's talk. Yes.
Good question. Um, are you referring back to when I was talking about the church is doing harm, like tangible harm? Yeah. Um, well, one, I think simply calling them out. I think so many of those... What would that look like? Yeah. How you do that? Sorry. I think so many conservative churches that are LGBT exclusive in particular just don't know or have blinded themselves from the information that's available to them that says non-inclusive theology causes psychological harm to LGBT people. And so I think getting that information in front of them has been helpful. Um, it's not easy. That's not an easy process. But I also do think there's been a tendency among a lot of progressives, um, progressive evangelicals in particular, to be afraid to call people out, uh, call institutions out, because that's what the conservatives used to do. But there is a biblical imperative. There is a prophetic moral imperative to say, if harm is being done, you must be held accountable. And so I also try at mission gathering from the pulpit. If there's some harm being done, if there's something that's happening in the world, we need to be using any platform that we have to call that out. But also, um, in the last book that we put together, a book called Our Witness, The Unheard Stories of LGBT Christians, the goal of that book was simply to put stories and the facts about the harm that were being done in front of conservative pastors. And so that's one way we've been trying to do that on our side of things. But I just encourage you to, if you have relationships with non-inclusive people, talk to them. Let them know. Let them hear the actual story and impact of the fruit of their exclusive teaching. Yeah. I'm a pastor in a UCC church that's open and affirming. Awesome. And um, we have uh, folks who've come to our congregation who had been part of other progressive church communities. And one of the reasons they joined ours, they said, well, you're actually spiritual. Yeah. And uh, what's your own experience? What do you do in your own faith community? Where, because sometimes there's a sense of, well, we got to get, get rid of God and the Bible if we're going to really be inclusive. Yeah. So how have you integrated that? Thank you. Well, I think... Being radically inclusive also um, calls us to acknowledge something that makes a lot of people even more uncomfortable, which is Christian privilege, um, and to begin to understand the ways in which, even as Christian communities or communities that follow Christ, we don't hold a monopoly on spirituality. And so at Mission Gathering, um, one, I'll admit, I've definitely more fallen on the side of being um, social gospel -y over the past year, my first year there, instead of focusing on the robust spirituality. And I don't think you have to choose one or the other. That's just where I'm at, my own personal journey. But the other emphasis is, let's figure out how to allow people to reconnect and engage with indigenous traditions that are indigenous to them in their own path, or traditions that might not be necessarily essentially Christian. And I want to be careful about that, because there's a colonizing aspect you have to be careful with. But just understanding that there are various ways to be spiritual. And at Mission Gathering, one of the frustrations I have is so many people come into the community and are disappointed because I don't stand up and say, read your Bible and pray every day. Because for me, those aren't helpful practices anymore, but they are for some people. And I just think having that openness to say that the kingdom of God, Jesus said, is established both internally and externally. There's a spiritual grounding before the physical manifestation takes place. Um, but I don't know if that answers anything, but that's just what we're doing right now, what I'm doing right now. Yeah, no. So can radical inclusion, can that, in, or should it, include uh, uh, those uh, people who, are, who are, do have conservative and traditional views on you know, LGBT or, or whatever? Yeah. Do you just let them slip out the back door? Do you convert them? Do you tolerate them? I mean, what, what's the right thing? Yeah. Uh, I don't know what the right thing is. Um, this is the last question that I'll be able to answer, but it's a really good one that I could talk about for five hours. Because in the process and in the book, I actually come to the, uh, uh, the conclusion, and it's very unpopular, that you cannot include the exclusive. Inclusive communities cannot be seeking to include the exclusive. Um, that's unpopular. Um, I think my own pastoral colleagues would disagree with me on that. But... If we're going to create a space that's really committed to radical justice, we're not calling for conformity in theology. Every week at Mission Gathering, I say, what I preach on the pulpit is not what this church believes. It's my opinion. This is a community of conversation. And we have, I have Trump voters in our congregation, but they have to agree to, it takes a lot for them to stay in a community where I'm not afraid to stand up in the pulpit and call out what I see as an affront to the gospel and damage to people. Um, 
And that's one of the things the conservative arguments often come against us. They say, well, look at you liberals that claim to be so tolerant, but you're so intolerant of us. And now I've started to say, of course we're intolerant of you. You cannot have true tolerance by embracing those who are pushing out the very people you're trying to be tolerant of. It just, it creates a system that doesn't work. It creates a system that, I, in my experience, is abusive and unhealthy. And the last thing I'll say, um, I was involved a few years ago in third way church movements, which were the churches that tried to be LGBT inclusive, have one pastor that was inclusive and one that wasn't, and create a community. My experience is that doesn't work. If you're a conservative, why would you ever stand up and be a leader in a church with another pastor who you believe is preaching a false gospel and heresy that's harming people? Like, the ideologies just don't work together. And there's been a few communities that have endured over a few years, but I just find it really hard to create any sort of space where healing and actual good work can be done when you're always wondering how do we keep in those that actually think everything that we're doing is sinful or wrong or heretical. So that's my unpopular opinion on that. But, and I think that's all the time we have. So thank you all so much.